Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I am Carrie Miller, the program director at NYU in Washington, D.C., and on behalf of the NYU Bradley Center and NYU's Office of Global Programs, it is an honor and privilege to welcome you all to our Constitution Day presentation, highlighting the research of Dr. Kevin Kenny. So before we get started, there are a few individuals that I would like to recognize before our intro of the topic and the speaker. And I want to recognize a few colleagues that we have from the Embassy of Ireland. Thank you for coming. And I also want to recognize Tom McIntyre and Dwayne Stewart, who are always instrumental in putting these gatherings together. So thank you. And lastly, I would like to thank our NYU students in the audience who are studying in the capital this semester. <laughs> Learning, growing, and engaging Washington, D.C. in all of its promise and complexities. So thank you for joining us this evening. So what do I mean by promise and complexities? The paradox of the promise and complexities of our new nation ultimately rests in the title of Kevin Kinney's work. The full text is entitled, The Problem of Immigration and the Slaveholding Republic, Policing Mobility in the 19th Century United States. It is unquestionable that there is great promise in this new nation with the federal government established in the 19th century as a blank canvas of possibilities that we now know as the U.S. Constitution. The binding document is set to outline a new national government, new national policies, and a new national structure, taking close consideration of the unique, special, and sacred identities of state borders and cultures. This recognition of state borders and cultures in the 19th century, and to this day, highlights the very complexities that are featured in Dr. Kennedy's book, as well as in national rights, states' rights, and as Dr. Kennedy thoroughly interrogates in the text, human rights. Dr. Kennedy's work follows and elaborates on the complicated conditions of non-European migrants and people of African descent living precarious lives under the complicated conditions of a constitution grappling between national and states' rights. We have the honor this evening in engaging Kevin and his work, and I look forward to both his lecture and the questions to follow. Now, an introduction to Dr. Kevin Kenny. Kevin Kenny is Professor of History and Gluckspin Professor in Irish Studies at New York University. He received his PhD in American History from Columbia University in 1994, where his dissertation won the prestigious Bancroft Award. With multiple books to his credit, his first book, Making Sense of the Molly Maguires, examines how traditions of Irish rural protests were transplanted into industrial America. His second book, The American Irish, A History, offers a general survey of the field. A third book, Peaceable Kingdom Lost, analyzes the unraveling of William Penn's utopian vision of harmonious coexistence between Native Americans and European colonists. And finally, his last book, The Aspera, a very short introduction, examines the origins, meaning, and utility of a central concept in the study of migration, with particular reference to Jewish, African, Irish, and Asian history. Dr. Kinney is also editor of the text Ireland and the British Empire, and he has published articles on immigration in the Journal of American History and the Journal of American Ethnic History, among other venues. His latest book, The Problem of Immigration and a Slaveholding Republic, Policing Mobility in the 19th Century United States, explains how slavery shaped immigration policy as it moved from the local to the national level in the period from the American Revolution through the end of Reconstruction. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Kenny. Uh, thank you, Carrie, for that introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, Tom McIntyre, and um, everybody at uh, NYU Center in Washington, D.C., my first time here. 
Uh, thanks also to all of you uh, for coming out this evening and to our friends and family who may be uh, watching on Zoom. So what I'm going to do is take uh, about uh, half an hour, no, uh, no longer, to lay out um, the problem, uh, the problem of immigration in the slaveholding republic. And I, Carrie and, and I will then be engaged in conversation. And above all, I hope that we'll get a Q&A going with the, um, with the audience. There's a, there's a lot to uh, discuss here. So in, in the United States today, uh, the federal government controls immigration in the sense of uh, regulating who to admit, who to exclude, who to remove. And yet, in the century following the American Revolution, Congress played only a very limited role in immigration policy. The states, as sovereign entities within a federal system of government, patrolled their own borders and set their own rules for community membership. The national immigration policy did not emerge in the United States until the 1870s. And the timing uh, during the era of civil war and reconstruction was no coincidence. And the central claim that I am making is that the existence, abolition, and legacies of slavery, more than any other force, shaped American immigration policy as it moved from the local to the national level in the course of the 19th century. And I'll lay out that uh, argument for you this evening uh, under these five headings. I want to look firstly at federal control over Black and Native American mobility in the 19th century. I want to look, uh, uh, given the occasion, at the Constitution and immigration, uh, in particular, the tension between what is known as police power and commerce power. Uh, thirdly, I will look at questions of citizenship, the Civil War and Reconstruction. Uh, fourthly, at Chinese exclusion and the emergence of what's called the plenary power doctrine of uh, immigration power in the United States. And then finally, I want to touch on some of the ongoing tensions in immigration federalism today. So let me um, address um, my first point, uh, which is federal control over mobility, which was uh, quite limited, um, but was very important in controlling three kinds of population movement that intersected with immigration in important ways. These were the return of fugitive slaves, the removal of free black people overseas, and the expulsion of Native Americans to the interior. So firstly, um, the uh, question of fugitives. The fugitive slave clause of the US Constitution required, quote, that persons held to service unquote, who escape from bondage must, quote, be delivered up on the claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Congress passed legislation on that basis uh, in 1793, the first Fugitive Slave Act in American history. In the case of Prigg versus Pennsylvania in 1842, the Supreme Court found that the 1793 federal statute took precedence over a state law that made it a felony to remove, uh, quote, any Negro or mulatto, unquote, with a view to enslaving them. So the uh, federal uh, law, 1793 statute, uh, trumps uh, local law that is intended to help uh, black people in this case. Northern states responded by passing what were called uh, personal liberty laws to protect free black people and escaped slaves. Southern uh, slaveholders, conversely, demanded stronger federal regulation for their property rights in humans. And Congress uh, responded by passing a second Fugitive Slave Act in 1850 allowing enslavers or their agents to arrest suspected fugitives, to take them before a wide range of officials who issued certificates of removal. 
no fugitive was allowed to testify in any trial or hearing uh, under this law. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 uh, targeted African Americans uniquely, but its system of forced and arbitrary removal and its lack of due process or judicial oversight, as the legal scholar Carla McCanders has noted, uh, prefigured the mechanisms for deporting immigrants that were introduced later in American history in the post-Bellum era. Second area where the federal government was involved was the so-called colonization movement, which was the removal of free black people from the United States um, to other destinations. Some left voluntarily for Haiti, for Canada, or Africa, but most were removed um, uh, through the um, so-called colonization scheme. Um, colonization was not emigration. Even when voluntary, and it, it was uh, nominally voluntary, its purpose was to expel free black people from this country on the grounds that they could never achieve civil or political equality. In other words, it was a, a form of social engineering based on waste. The American Colonization Society, founded in 1817 as a semi-public enterprise, uh, funded in part by the Monroe administration, transported about 11,000 people, most of them formerly enslaved, to Liberia. Some African Americans saw advantages uh, initially in voluntary departure, uh, but certainly uh, none of them supported compulsory removal. The third area where the federal government was involved is uh, Indian removal. The Indian Removal Act of 1830 created the machinery that expelled more than 80,000 people from the southeast uh, to locations across the Mississippi River. And for a moment, it looked like the Supreme Court might intervene and stop that process. Chief Justice John Marshall, in the case of Worcester v. Georgia in 1832, defined Native American nations as distinct, independent political communities subject to the jurisdiction of the federal government, but not of the states. Uh, this uh, ruling, however, lacked any uh, enforcing mechanism. It did not prevent the trail of tears. In 1846, uh, the Supreme Court, now under Roger Tony rather than John Marshall, uh, rejected this position of uh, autonomous um, nationhood and ruled instead that native tribes were simply collections of individuals bound together by race endowed only with whatever rights the federal government chose to bestow on them. So you have two very different principles there, one of tribal autonomy, the other of minority status, that really stand in uneasy tension in Native American policy throughout the 19th century. And that second decision, United States v. Rogers in 1846, um, actually gave to Congress what's called a plenary power uh, a power largely immune from judicial review that again helps lay the groundwork for immigration policy uh, in the post bellum era, a point I will uh, return to towards the end. So when it came to regulating immigration, immigration by foreigners coming to the country, by contrast, Congress played almost no role uh, before the Civil War. And strangely, for a country that attracted so many immigrants, that's known as a nation of immigrants, uh, the Constitution says nothing about their admission, exclusion, or expulsion. The sole provision in the Constitution pertaining to immigration has to do with naturalization. In other words, what happens to foreigners after they come here and their capacity or otherwise to become uh, citizens. So the Constitution has a, natural, a naturalization clause um, whereby Congress is empowered to craft a uniform rule for naturalization. And Congress did precisely that in four pieces of legislation. The Naturalization Acts passed in uh, between 1719 and 1802 which put in, in place the system, uh, pretty much the system that's still in place today, uh, which is to say uh, citizenship 
after a probationary period of residence, accompanied by evidence of good character and an oath renouncing allegiance to foreign powers. Uh, that sounds great. In a certain sense, it is great. That's a very, very liberal policy. Anybody can become an American, except the laws state explicitly that naturalization applies only if you are a free white person. And this is really shocking if you don't know it, but not until 1870 was the right to naturalize extended to people of African origin, and not until the 1940s and 1950s could Asian immigrants naturalize as citizens in the United States, even though their children were automatic birthright citizens under the 14th Amendment. And so that's something really for us to uh, think about. Other than naturalization, uh, the Constitution is silent on the question of immigration. There are certain parts of the Constitution from which one could infer federal power. Uh, these are, for example, the taxing and spending clause, if you go into the details, to the extent that immigrants were classified as imp imports, Congress uh, might have power. Uh, the war powers clause, to the extent that immigrants might be classified as enemy aliens, Congress might have power. Uh, more significantly, I think, the treaty power clause um, that enables the president to craft immigration through diplomacy. A lot of immigration policy towards England and towards China in the 19th century was done through diplomacy and uh, treaty. Um, perhaps the most controversial part of the Constitution is um, the migration or importation clause. Uh, very um, um, carefully and awkwardly uh, worded. The migration or importation of such persons as any of the states shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by Congress prior to the year 1808 uh, by the tax of what, what, what is that strange uh, clause saying? It, it is one of the three compromises over slavery, the three main compromises over slavery written into the Constitution. Um, the other the others being the Fugitive Slave Act and the Three Fifths Clause. And what it's saying is it's recognizing the existence of the external slave trade by saying uh, Congress cannot prohibit the external slave trade for 20 years. That's the compromise. Uh, Georgia and South Carolina didn't want it prohibited. Certain northern states wanted it prohibited slave trade. So it's a 20 year moratorium. Migration or importation. Uh, there's the rub from a legal or constitutional point of view because some people read that as saying, okay, Congress cannot touch um, the uh, migration of people before 1808, but after 1808 it can, and that includes immigration as well as the external slave trade. There's a big debate uh, over that topic. Really, the consensus is that migration implication clauses about the external slave trade, but there are uh, voices, persistent voices in American politics and jurisprudence saying, well, no, uh, this might give Congress the uh, power to control migration, not simply the importation of human beings to the external slave trade. Um, the migration importation clause actually is um, a 20 year qualification on one of the best known parts of the Constitution, which is the Commerce Clause. So it's, it's imposing a 20 year uh, hiatus on uh, the external slave trade in particular. The Commerce Clause gives Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. That is the power that Congress uh, has under the Constitution. In the case of Gibbon versus Ogden in 1824, uh, Chief Justice John Marshall, once again, defined commerce very broadly to include navigation, the movement of people, not just the movement of goods. And that potentially puts immigration uh, under the heading of commerce, which, of course, would bring uh, Congress into the picture. It puts other forms of human mobility under the heading of, Congress to, of commerce, too, most notably the um, internal slave trade. The Congress had the power to prohibit the external slave trade. Abolitionists asked, well, why not the internal slave trade? 
isn't that a form of commerce in human property? Ought not Congress uh, to be involved there too? The issue, however, in a federal system of government, which is what the Constitution sets up, is that each state retains its sovereignty within the system over matters on which it has not explicitly surrendered power to the national government. So towns and states in antebellum America before the Civil War used their police power to regulate mobility within and across their borders. Now, that term police uh, today refers to a body of people charged with keeping public order and investigating uh, crimes. In the 19th century, police had a related but broader meaning that has to do with the right of local communities to regulate the health, safety, morals, and welfare of their residents to define the public good uh, along those lines. And on this basis, using their retained sovereign powers under the Constitution, deploying their police power, state and local governments passed uh, laws that prohibited the arrival of foreign convicts, that required ship captains to post bonds or pay taxes to cover the expenses of foreign paupers in case they became a public charge, that ordered the deportation of paupers um, to their states of origin, and sometimes uh, even out of the country. Uh, the historian Hidetaka Hirota has found about 50,000 uh, deported for, out of Massachusetts, most of them Irish paupers uh, over the course of the 19th century. These laws also quarantined native-born and foreign uh, passengers who carried contagious diseases. They patrolled the movement of free and enslaved black people within and between states. They confined free black sailors visiting southern ports to uh, jail, sometimes on their vessel, sometimes in, in the city jail, for the duration of their stay in port, um, uh, calling them a source of moral contagion because a free black body contradicts the racial logic of slavery. The racial logic of slavery is that the natural condition of people of African descent is to be enslaved. So the presence of a free black person is very threatening to that racist logic. So we can see the, um, that's, uh, those are the elements of police power, so I have just uh, described them to quality of convicts, bonds, and tax and deportation, and controlling the movement of free black, uh, black people. We can see the constitutional um, debate and struggle over mobility in the 19th century as uh, pitting these two different forms of power against each other. Uh, national commerce power, it resides with Congress. Police power, which is local and resides with uh, states and towns. And it's a dilemma for the Supreme Court every time the court looks at cases that come before it, uh, challenging um, state laws. The dilemma is if, for example, um, the Supreme Court were to invalidate a state law in Massachusetts taxing uh, Irish-born paupers coming into the country, what are the implications for other forms of, of mobility, in particular the movement of free black people uh, between the states? So that's a really live contested political issues. Uh, Southern slaveholders are always looking at um, these uh, court cases. I'll mention a couple, couple of them. And really what the court does is it dances around the issue rather than uh, addressing it squarely because it's an issue that can't really be resolved in a slaveholding republic. We'll give you a couple of examples. In the, uh, the first immigration case that comes before the Supreme Court in American history is New, New York uh, versus Mill. But this is a case where, uh, in, in these days, the states are controlling immigration, not the federal government. New York has a statute requiring that ship captains furnish a report on all of the passengers. And uh, shipping companies don't like this because it interferes with their business. They put lots of the famous cases, and this isn't a famous case, but lots of the uh, 
Supreme Court cases we, we read about are test cases that were pushed through by somebody. So shipping companies challenge this. They want to know, well, who has the power to regulate uh, foreign Im immigration into the United States? Is it Congress under the Congress power or is it the state of New York under uh, its police power? Well, the Supreme Court looks at this and, and decides that the New York statute it does not violate the Constitution uh, on the grounds that it was not, uh, to quote, uh, and I quote, not uh, a regulation of commerce, but a regulation of police. In other words, um, that um, states have the reserved power to control immigration because of the impact uh, that um, poor immigrants in particular or diseased immigrants would have on the local community. Now, this affirmation of police power reassured Southern observers that the federal uh, commerce power would not be used to control the movement of free black people. But it fell short of something that they really wanted, which was the claim that they have that the states and the national government had concurrent power over commerce. That's not what the court decides. It just decides that this kind of regulation is a matter of local police power. The commerce is still um, uh, with Congress. When the court uh, addresses uh, directly the question of taxes and bonds that states impose on immigrants, they tie themselves up in all sorts of knots. Uh, they actually issue eight, the nine justices issue eight separate opinions in the passenger cases in 1849. Now, nominally, five of them say uh, that uh, state laws imposing taxes on immigrants are um, unconstitutional under the Commerce Power. This, I say nominally because that decision has no impact. The states say, okay, well, these are not taxes. These are commutation fees. Um, they stay in place uh, for another generation. That's the practicality on the ground. What's important about the passenger cases is not their impact on policy, but that the four dissenters, led by um, Chief Justice Roger Tony, warned that overturning state immigration laws would lead to federal tyranny. And tyranny uh, in that context was a code word for any threat to the interest of the slave states. If Congress could control mobility to the extent claimed by the fair majority in the passenger cases, Tony warned, it could decide for each state, quote, who should or should not be permitted to reside among its citizens. And Roger Tony did not believe that free black people enjoyed the freedom to travel from state to state within the Union because he did not regard them as citizens, a point he developed with devastating effect in the Dred Scott case of 1857 when he ruled for the court that no African, whether free or enslaved, was entitled to national citizenship because, in his view, they were not part of the body politic created uh, by the framers of the Constitution. That is the most notorious uh, decision of all you know, yeah, by the Supreme Court in American history. Now, this question of citizenship is uh, complicated very important. It's very important on Constitution Day. Uh, the Constitution itself mentions uh, citizenship a number of times. It draws a distinction between national citizenship and state citizenship, uh, but it, it never says anything about what citizenship is. It offers no definition. It doesn't say what citizenship means or what privileges and immunities might uh, come with that uh, concept. In this context, and the antebellum states define their own rules for civil and political uh, membership. Um, country of birth is much less important than race or gender. You can be born on the soil and excluded from citizenship. You can come from Europe as an immigrant and you can naturalize uh, as, a citizen, as a citizen. So it's not until 1868 uh, with the ratification during Reconstruction of the 14th Amendment that citizenship is defined in the Constitution. And the 14th Amendment uh, 
does a number of things on which we may discuss later. Uh, it's opening and most famous goals to find citizenship uh, by two criteria and two criteria only. Uh, you're born here or you naturalize. So through birth on the soil or through naturalization. A principle of birthright citizenship uh, has long roots in, in American history. African Americans have been agitating for uh, birthright citizenship for two generations before it became part of the Constitution. It took a civil war in the United States to write that into the Constitution. Um, the 14th Amendment, which is under threat uh, today, um, became uh, a very powerful force for assimilating immigrants and their children uh, into the uh, body politic of the United States, regardless of their background or origin. So this comes out of the Civil War, obviously, and I want to talk now in my third uh, point about um, the impact of the Civil War. Civil War changes everything, and immigration policy is no exception. So if you think about it the way I've laid out the argument, the Civil War, uh, the secession of 11 states from the Union and the abolition of slavery, removes the political and constitutional obstacles to a national immigration policy. That's the impact of the Civil War. But I want to um, suggest that it would be a mistake on that basis to think that if slavery had been abolished a generation earlier, or two generations earlier, that Congress would have stepped in to regulate immigration. So this is an important, this really in some ways is, is a key to my argument. So the Civil War makes the national immigration policy possible, but it doesn't make it inevitable. Because if you think about it, a lot of people in the um, 19th century before the Civil War were critical of the main immigrant group at that time, the Irish. A lot of people didn't like the Irish. There was plenty of nativist prejudice against them. But nobody was calling for numerical restriction of European immigrants until the end of the 19th century. The most the nativists wanted in, in the middle of the 19th century was to extend the naturalization eating period from five years to 21 years. That was one of their very valid They didn't even succeed in that. So we need to, to, to realize that Constitutionally, politically, the lockdown is broken, but there has to be a historical contingency. Something else has to change that's going to tilt the balance towards a national immigration policy. That something is the arrival of Chinese immigrants in large numbers in the United States, coinciding with the era of civil war and reconstruction. Now, Chinese immigration took um, a variety of forms. The Chinese, like any other immigrants, came to the United States under a variety of arrangements. Some of them were businessmen, some were wage workers, some were uh, close to what we would call indentured servants. These differences didn't matter much to their enemies. And what I found in my research is that restrictionists, those who were trying to limit the uh, arrival of the Chinese into the United States, uh, came up with a really pernicious but effective um, distorted anti-slavery argument. And the argument uh, is, as I put up there, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution prohibits slavery, except uh, as punishment for a crime. There's always a subject, but it prohibits slavery in the United States. The distorted anti-slavery argument against Chinese immigrants is that Chinese laborers, known as coolies, are the equivalent of slaves. All that's not true. Um, secondly, all Chinese laborers are coolies, so that's not true either. But the the twisted syllogism, if you like, is coolies are slaves, all Chinese laborers are coolies, therefore the Chinese must be excluded because you cannot have slavery in the United States. That's an argument that's grasped up sometimes as humanitarian, but that leads directly to legislation in the 1870s and the 1880s uh, targeting the Chinese as the first group in American history whose uh, immigration will be restricted. The Page Act of 1875 criminalizes the importation of prostitutes, the claim being that any Chinese women who are coming 
are engaged in that activity. Chinese women are abroad, so uh, in China are subjected to consular inspection to try and figure out are they engaged, uh, are they coming for lewd or immoral purposes. This, this legislation um, makes all Chinese women except the elite uh, suspect. And it has an extraordinary impact because if women can't come, then Chinese men in the United States cannot create families in the United States. They often create transnational families. Uh, partly as a result of the pay gap in 1875, the sex ratios in the Chinese uh, population in the, in the United States are 27 to 1 male, female by 18 So again, this, this is introducing gender and mechanism uh, gender and marriage as mechanisms of immigration control is a form of um, population engineering. In 1882, um, Congress excludes Chinese laborers, skilled and unskilled, uh, legislation, again, that targets a group and that discriminates uh, actually by class as well as by race, because laborers are excluded, but students, merchants, ministers, and other uh, elite classes are um, allowed to uh, continue coming in. The system of um, registration, exclusion, uh, incarceration, deportation has at least some precedence in the antebellum South, where again, free black people have faced uh, similar restrictions on their movement, had to carry papers, had to register, had to pay bonds. Uh, and were subject uh, to expulsion or denied the entry in the United States if they return. So let me turn uh, to my fourth point, uh, which is the uh, emergence. Yes, and, and I'll uh, talk for about uh, five more minutes. Um, I want to uh, talk about the emergence on the basis of what I've outlined so far of the national immigration policy in the United States. And then I just want to touch at the end uh, on um, questions of immigration federalism today. So the system that emerges firstly in the Chinese case um, is uh, then broadened to include federal control over immigration more generally. But by the 1870s, the Supreme Court can declare unanimously that uh, immigration is a federal matter. Unanimously, there's no there's no contention. Slavery is gone, right? Slavery had ha, been blocking this. Um, you have the Immigration Act of 1882. That's the General Immigration Act. It's really modelled on the old state precedents. It's even designed and implemented by officials in New York and Massachusetts. As, uh, you see the details there, imposing a head tax on people likely to become a public charge, and that is expanded in 1891. The key issue here, though, is um, a justification is still needed for sweeping federal uh, authority over immigration. This keeps coming up before the court, the Supreme Court. If uh, Congress and the president are now implementing a national policy, ultimately, on what uh, basis does that policy lie? And the answer is extraordinary because the answer essentially in the Chinese exclusion case of 1889 is that power to regulate immigration is extra constitutional. You don't need to look at the text of the constitution to find authority. It's not there. But that authority is inherent in the sovereignty of any independent nation. Any independent nation, by definition, uh, has the power to control its borders. That power predates the writing of the Constitution. The Constitution establishes a set of rules for something that already exists. So this is the doctrine of power inherent in sovereignty. It's also known as the plenary power doctrine because uh, what the Supreme Court says is that this is a matter of national security and as such it is under the purview of the two political branches of government the legislature and the executive, um, the courts should back away, that this should be largely immune to judicial review. Now, if that sounds in any way um, familiar, it's because as recently as the Trump travel, in the case of you know, um, 
Trump versus the United States, the Supreme Court upheld uh, that travel ban on the grounds of power inherent in sovereignty. Um, this same power inherent in sovereignty rests on a claim to control the national territory. Uh, there are at that time several hundred uh, semi-independent native uh, nations of the United States who also have territorial boundary claims. And one of the things I uh, show in the book is how this plenary power uh, that I've described is a part of the realm of immigration, but also in native American culture. So let me just conclude uh, by touching on some of the ways in which um, these issues are uh, relevant uh, today. Historians sometimes do that, sometimes uh, they don't. The point I want to make is that the federal government certainly has controlled uh, immigration in the sense of admissions, expulsions, deportations since the late 19th century for reasons I've explained. And in that sense, immigration is a federal matter. There is, however, the question of once immigrants come into the country, um, what role do states and towns and counties and municipalities play then? It's not as though, uh, as, as though the states of their police power uh, have become, uh, some have become uh, irrelevant. Or so you have immigration in the sense of entering the country, being excluded or deported, but you have the lives of immigrants uh, as they um, try and uh, uh, make uh, uh, something uh, of, of their new lives here. And I would say what I see is a bifurcation in immigration federalism. There are some very well-known cases where states will monitor and punish immigrants. California Proposition 187 in 1994 is a well-known example. More recently, legislation in Arizona uh, that is really, in effect, uh, seeking to deputize uh, local government as uh, an arm of federal law, law enforcement. Uh, what I would say on that is that there is a striking parallel here with the antebellum era. It takes us back to those personal liberty laws that I described. So in the antebellum era, on the one hand, the um, slave states were saying that slavery is a local institution, the federal government should not interfere in any way. But on the other hand, they were saying we need federal government to interfere in one way, and that's with a stronger fugitive slave law. In the United States today, some local jurisdictions uh, cooperate with immigration enforcement, with ICE, uh, and seek to uh, monitor, to punish, and to deter immigrants. That's one direction in which things are headed. We know this, we read about it every day. Um, but also, some other states in California and New York and other places um, do the opposite. They provide sanctuary to immigrants, or they say, well, we don't actually have to enforce federal law. We can't break federal law, but we are not agents of law. Right? So I see I see that bifurcation uh, at work today. I see that in other areas in American politics to do with reproductive rights, to do with public health in COVID. If, if there's a question here of where in the, in the United States do you live and what rights uh, are you enjoying? So in conclusion, I obviously, given my subject, I have to say that um, local sovereignty and states rights, given its association with slavery and Jim Crow in American history, might be an unlikely direction in which to look uh, for um, a progressive politics, if you like, assisting uh, immigrants. It's a thin reed on which to base uh, a movement of that kind. Uh, clearly, uh, federally protected rights are more powerful. And the 14th Amendment is still with us here today. But I will say that I uh, did the research for this book and, and much of the writing in, in a, a context where the federal government itself was very lengthy anti immigrant. And in that context, um, there was some ground for hope in local sovereignty defined not simply as autonomy from federal power, but as an affirmative commitment to the rights of all residents, uh, regardless of their background or color. Thank you. So I think we... Yep. 
we are going to open up our conversation to questions from the audience. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, JP Hogan, uh, you, there's a few things that come together. Um, the, the, a free white person uses free. There's the three fifths clause. That's a metric for when someone would be a slave like Lynn at a 60% fail rate yep. on what would be the Christian morals. So a coolie, if he's not 60% moral, could be falling into the metric of slave. Um, but I, I, I was also curious back then, what would have been the public spaces if someone was in a community and part of the three fifths would have been, if you are moral within, within the community, where is the individual, where are the arguments for what mobility an individual right to move about? Where, where is the public space? Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay, uh, so, so I alluded to the three fifths clause as as one of there are several explicit and some implicit um, um, compromises on slavery in the Constitution. The the document itself does not use the word slavery. It it is after all the the slave or slavery. It is the foundational document of a, a radical experiment in Republican democracy. So it uses euphemisms like persons held, held to service. So I, I mentioned um, the migration or importation clause recognizes the existence of slavery in the slave trade by saying that it, uh, Congress can't touch it for 20 years. I mentioned the Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, and then the third thing I mentioned was the three-fifths clause. Uh, so ju just for the audience and for the students in the audience, perhaps you, you know this well already, uh, when it comes to representation in Congress, uh, it's apportioned based on the size of the population. So Southern states therefore wanted slaves to be counted as uh, people, uh, even though under the law, they did not treat them as people. Uh, Northern states did not want them to be counted at all. And the crude compromise uh, is that, that they would be counted as three fifths of a person for purposes of apportionment in Congress, also, uh, interestingly, that translates into apportionment in the Electoral College. And it, it has a decisive impact on uh, certain uh, elections uh, at, the, at the turn of the 19th century. Um, the figure of the coolie is a shorthand term, a pejorative term, describing uh, Chinese laborers in the 19th century and seeking to equate them with uh, slaves, and on that grounds, put forward this distorted anti-slavery argument that uh, exclusion is justified. Um, your question, uh, Mr. Hogan, is what, what is the public space in which this is unfolding? Is that, is that correct? Well, Lando, if, if one to go from one state to another. Oh, yeah, yeah. One that would be your public space would be on someone else's property. Yeah, yeah, Inter interesting question. So the, the the system of bonds and taxes that I um, mentioned to you uh, that is introduced by northern states, say, to regulate the arrival of Irish paupers, very similar system is used even more extensively to regulate the movement of free black people uh, who want to cross state borders. Now, the property question I can't really uh, answer, uh, except property comes into, into bonding and taxing. Um, there's always a disparity between the law as written and the law as practiced. So law on the books will say that if you're a black person entering uh, what was then called the Old Northwest, which is today's Midwest, uh, that you would have to find somebody who would uh, put up a bond in case you became a public charge. Now, were these laws always uh, enacted as written? No, but did their presence on the statute books uh, serve as um, a form of social control and of stigma? Yes, I sometimes, my own mind though not in the book, compare them to the penal laws in Ireland, uh, which weren't always uh, enacted, but that did impose stigma and shame. The question of, 
the physical track uh, whose property you're crossing. I, I don't have a good answer for that. That's a question I'll take with me. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, My question is so with the history of immigration. Would it be correct to say that it's been defined on the basis of race? And why I say that is you mentioned at the outset that the Irish were hated, but there was no Irish exclusion, act. there was a Chinese exclusion. So there was a, uh, you know, China, there was no Irish Exclusion Act, but there was a Chinese Exclusion Act. And if you look at modern immigration policy in this country, there's been a quota system, which has, until recently, largely favored European immigration as a deviation. Yeah, um, uh, a good question, clearly understood. Uh, the question is, uh, would I say that immigration policy in the United States has been defined largely on the basis of race, and uh, the answer is yes, in, in several respects, some of which you've touched on. Let, let me touch on uh, a few aspects of that. Um, so there is uh, undoubtedly in the first wave of mass immigration into the United States, which is um, predominantly Irish, German, and uh, British, the Irish are the most visible group in part because they cluster in cities. You know, one in every four New Yorkers in 1850 is Irish born. Um, the presence of the Irish uh, provokes a nativist reaction, a response, uh, a hostile, discriminatory uh, response to the Irish uh, based on their poverty, based on their um, religion based on uh, mundane things like uh, how they speak, how they look, how they dress, they're different from us. This is a, a trope in uh, American immigration. What does not happen, and I alluded to this in, in, in my talk, is despite the power of political nativism in what was called the Know Nothing movement, uh, what does not happen is anything like numerical restriction or exclusion. So there is a well-developed uh, subfield in immigration history, uh, best captured by the title of a book. That book is How the Irish Became White. Uh, it's not a, a line of inquiry. Actually, that makes a great deal of sense to me, the way I'm approaching history in this book. From a, a, a legal and constitutional point of view, there is no question on which side of the color line Irish immigrants stood. Uh, they could enter the country freely. There were no restrictions. They could move around the country freely. They could uh, get work. They could naturalize as citizens. And when they did so, they could uh, exercise the vote and hold political office. In other words, they could do all of the things that most African-Americans free or enslaved and most Chinese immigrants could not do. So I could not use the term race to describe uh, discrimination against the Irish uh, in the same category as I use it to d describe the enslavement of African Americans or the exclusion of Chinese. So there's a distinction there that's fundamental. I'm not trying to uh, downplay the degree of the prejudice and nastiness and bigotry that immigrants, including Irish immigrants, were on the receiving end, but I am trying to distinguish it from chattel slavery or from Chinese exclusion. In the 20th century, a national origins quota system is devised to restrict immigration by the federal government. The effect of that is uh, threefold. Firstly, the number of immigrants entering the United States is reduced from about 1 million to about 150,000. Secondly, among those who are coming in, a preference system is set up so that immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe from Italy, from Greece, uh, from, from the uh, uh, Jewish pale in, uh, in Russia and Eastern Europe, uh, will constitute only a small minority. 
and the majority of immigrants coming in will be from Northwest Europe. And thirdly, uh, Asian immigration is cut off altogether. Remember, I explained uh, that Asian immigrants are not eligible to naturalize as citizens. So the argument made in the 1920s well, is, well, if they can't be, become citizens, then they should not be entering the country at all. So there's an absolute ban on Asian immigration from the 1920s until 1943. It's lifted for China because of the wartime alliance during World War II and eventually for uh, other Asian immigrants in the 50s and 60s. Since 1965, uh, we are currently living through the largest wave of immigration in American history. Uh, in gross numbers, it's larger now than it ever was. And for the first time, it's a genuinely global immigration. Today, only about 10% of immigrants come from Europe. 45% come from Asia, 45% uh, come from within this hemisphere, Latin America, especially Mexico. So yes. <laughs> I think I have a question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you see some connection in your research and our current issues in New York, for example, with the mayor pleading the case to the federal government that more resources are needed? And you also hear that from southern states as well, where there is a lack of taking responsibility for resources for the immigration issues and resources needed. How is that connection made? Yeah, um, thank you, Carrie. And again, again, this is this question of immigration federalism that I alluded to, and it's still playing out. So certain states in the Union, uh, Florida and Texas in particular, are using their police power to um, actually ship uh, immigrants, uh, the, the asylum seekers, those who have crossed the the, um, the border with, uh, with 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 papers, without papers, but undesirable immigrants, they are actually shipping them to places like Nantucket and New York City and, and Massachusetts, uh, uh, California. So the tension here is that a state. Uh, will set itself up in effect as a sanctuary state, will say that we welcome immigrants, that the governors of certain states that are receiving a lot of immigrants are, are, are um, saying, okay, we'll call that bluff. You want immigrants, we'll send you immigrants. It's a really horrible thing uh, that, uh, that's happening because, because uh, men, women, and children are being placed on uh, buses and shipped uh, up to uh, other states and, and just uh, dumped there. Uh, Mayor Adams was in the news uh, recently uh, saying that this influx will break New York City. And um, it won't break New York City. Uh, but it, uh, there are precedents for huge waves of immigration coming into uh, New York and into the United States. And one of them is the Irish famine. When I told you that one in four New Yorkers was Irish born. Now, it does uh, place a strain on resources. Uh, but will it break uh, the city that is iconic for immigration in um, not just the United States or the world? Uh, no, it won't. <laughs> and with that, oh, yes. This will be our last question. Oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> I'll take another one, but uh, please go ahead. So, yeah. so I sort of have two dimensions to yeah, this yeah. question. I hope yeah. that won't violate the rules here. But I'm really interested in your subtitle of policing mobility. Yeah. So it's yeah. the police power that you end up focusing on, not the commerce power. And I wonder to what extent the interpretation of the police powers and the allocation between the federal and the state responsibility yeah. has been distorted by these racial concepts. Mm -hmm. And then bringing it up to the present day, for example, this issue of intra-United States. So the federal government's going to control who comes across the border, right? Yeah. Once they're here, they're going to end up in one state or another. Mm -hmm. So you have different states contending for their sovereignty to defend their own boundaries. What I think is difficult, different about the situation that we have now is not a Texas or a Florida saying you can't come in, mm -hmm. but saying if you come in, we'll make your lives miserable. Yeah. And we claim the police power to send you somewhere else outside yep. our jurisdiction. Yep. And that puts them in a jurisdictional contact, conflict mm -hmm. with the places to which they're being sent, Chicago, mm -hmm. New York, mm -hmm. et cetera, Washington, D.C. Yep. 
Thank you. Uh, so the 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 subtitle um, policing um, mobility. Yes, there's a strong emphasis in the book on the police power of the states, and of course, with uh, federal supremacy over immigration policy understood as national borders, uh, that doesn't mean police powers go away, right? So the police powers are used in in um, the American South in the Jim Crow era to to police. Uh, black bodies and police powers are used today in the in the the second point you make, and I'll, I'll get to that in, in just one second. There is a sense um, in which I see, if you think of the antebellum states as uh, sovereign entities uh, within a federal system, I mean, you could think of of uh, the, uh, dual sovereignty as a an oxymoron, right? It can, how, how can sovereignty actually be dual? Uh, does it does it have um, one center, and maybe that's what the civil war is about, and it tilts the direction uh, towards the national government. But we still live in a federal uh, system of government. In a way, the claim to national authority over immigration that I outlined today, for me, is is a national version of the old police power writ large. So it's not just the borders of the state; it's the national borders. And what's really interesting. If you go into the sources, is it's the same international law authorities that the court is citing in both cases. So the court is upholding state sovereignty in the antebellum period, citing international law authorities. It cites the same authorities to uphold uh, national sovereignty uh, in, in the uh, postbellum period. The question then about um, about how this uh, plays out uh, today, um, it. It is a, uh, a conflict of, of jurisdiction, and um, it is precisely the exertion of police power uh, by the states uh, that is is at stake. It's, what I was kind of um, hinting at at the very end is is, is that local sovereignty can uh, be deployed to monitor, to detect, to punish, or uh, it can and is being deployed to to integrate immigrants uh, in, into local polities. And so much depends then on what, what part of the country we're talking about. When we talk about uh, immigration policy, on the one hand, we're talking about national borders, um, and that's immigration law, immigration policy. We also want to talk about laws and policies that affect immigrants when they're in the country. Uh, legal scholars would distinguish between immigration law and alienage law. So you have immigration law in the sense of borders, you have alienage law in the sense of once you have foreign people in the country, what measures uh, will be taken uh, to either um, detect, monitor, and punish, and in a certain way place pressure on the federal government to be more restrictive, or conversely, what measures might a local jurisdiction take to try and integrate people into the community based on what I described at the end as an affirmative commitment to all residents of a given jurisdiction because they're living there, regardless of their origin or background. So in New York, again, has a, a bill that's been in Albany for a long time, but it's still there, um, that would uh, define state citizenship in such a way, similar to, to national citizenship, there'd be a waiting period, proof of good character. But it doesn't matter uh, where you were born or how you entered the country. Uh, if you live in the polity, then certain rights, privileges, and immunities uh, will attach to that, including the right to vote in local elections. So that's a, that's a direction you could go into. Uh, this is... Um, Tensions over immigration that I've described in the 19th century, we see them playing out within the federal system that the uh, uh, of divided sovereignty that the Constitution originally created. No easy answer. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, defines citizenship. That's what it's most famous for. It does a number of other very interesting things too that are in the news these days. But just one of them that it does is that it extends the right of uh, due process and equal protection before the law to all persons, not just to citizens, to all persons uh, living a... Slaves are no longer free fit. Yeah. They're now a whole person. Yeah. The federal government stepped in because the states were being immoral. They were keeping people called slaves who had outgrown being free fit. So did they take over the federal government? They didn't take over the state's power. They ruled it was a moral house to take for exercise. Yeah, and in, in, those, in those terms, so to try and bring the, the two questions together, um, there are federally protected rights that states cannot violate. That's the, the, the 14th Amendment um, identifies things that states cannot do. Uh, but there are lots of things that, that states can do. And so you still have that balance and tension between local police power and federally protected rights. As I said at the end, uh, basing uh, a progressive politics on immigration uh, on states' rights would be, would be foolhardy. Yeah. 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 So by definition, some kind of due process for Texas. Yeah, yeah. So people who are immigrants who arrive in Texas, mm -hmm. why them to drop them off? On yeah. Do they have any due process? No. In the states, like the yeah. Latin and parents, yeah. Power, yeah. Could they take all the poor people? Could they ship out all the LGBTQ people? Yes. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yes, they can certainly try. Uh, do uh, these issues don't come before the courts until after they happen? So I think we're about out of time. <laughs> Thank you for the very engaging conversation. I want to encourage you to stay, especially if you have a book that you would like to be signed, and continue the conversation with Dr. Kenny. And Tom also has free books for our students, for our class. So we encourage you to read the entire book. I know I've given you the first chapter and continue to engage in the conversation. Which I will sign for you and you don't even have yeah. to pay. You know, so. <laughs> All right, could everybody give a hand to Dr. Kenny?